thank you um, in advance for indulging me for spending an hour just talking about myself. Um, I'm happy to be back here in Vermont. Uh, had a wonderful, quiet day. Um, and I'm starting, I've arranged my uh, material here in chronological order. And I made this drawing in 1962 when I was an undergraduate at the California College of what was then called Arts and Crafts. And my education was pretty typical in that it was Bauhaus with a little 19th century academic um, thrown in there. We had a l long sessions with the model that were required, uh, and then a lot of design classes. Uh, so it, it, the curriculum was pretty standard. And at a certain point, I thought, what am I doing here? What, what is being an artist all about? And uh, the question that I was asking was, what, uh, what am I doing that has to do with a lived life? And at that point, I started drawing the stories out of my head and drawing things that really mattered to me. And you can see here what mattered to me at the time. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, it was an incredible epiphany, and I did you know five to ten of these drawings every day, which are basically crayon on um, index paper, uh, eighteen by twenty-four inch uh, index paper, and that was sort of the beginning. Be previous to this, I had been painting abstractly. Um, oops back to that. And um, this was the beginning of uh, dealing with highly narrative and figurative imagery. Uh, I grew up in California. I grew up in East LA and also right around where CalArts is uh, located. And my great-grandfather was the first blacksmith uh, in Newhall in just around the turn of the century. And these are my relatives, uh, speaking of life, and they were always going out to experience nature. In this case, they're probably going out uh, camping for an extended period, maybe hunting. Uh, so I grew up with people who hardly ever had all their clothes on, uh, were real show-offs. This is my mother and my uncle on the left. Uh, this is my mother on the right. And I feel like a real Californian, and I feel like I'm the inheritor of this kind of mythology about one's relationship to nature. This is me at the age of five on the left with my uncle, uh, and this is my uncle and aunt on the right. My mother was one of the first uh, women bodybuilders, um, and I used to go with her occasionally to Muscle Beach, uh, where there would be a, a lot of <laughs> this kind of <laughs> uh, showing off. This is me, an art school uh, with my daughter. Uh, and I think that this was always a challenge for me, that life is awfully interesting. And it's very hard to turn your back on life and stick to the art. And uh, I, I still find it a challenge. Um, you have to have a lot of determination. Now, uh, this is a few years down the road from the drawing, uh, let's say five years. And this painting actually was painted in probably about 1965, uh, or perhaps a little later. And it was 
my first, the first time I used acrylic paint, which had actually just been invented, believe it or not. Uh, and it was a real relief because I'd been working with oil paint and uh, this was really good that I could go back to something that was more manageable for me. Uh, I've always been interested in bad taste and religious kitsch and uh, this kind of combines all aspects here. And I, basically I was really trying to avoid painting large and painting with oil paint. And I took on three dimensions. I really wouldn't call this work sculpture uh, because it's so pictorial, but I really enjoyed my involvement with it. And this really coincided, this was now the early 70s, and it really coincided with the beginning of the women's movement. And I belong to a women's group. Uh, and coincidentally enough, uh, there's four of us, or five of us, that are in a show at the Leslie Heller Gallery right now, up in New York, that were in the same women's group in 19, 1972. Um, but a lot of the issues were about what does it mean to be a woman artist. And one of the rules that I had heard of uh, in art school was, uh, well, you can tell a woman's work because it's decorative. And of course, being called decorative was the most pejorative insult that could be hurled at you. So I thought, mm, I'll show you decorative. <laughs> And so uh, I made these constructions that are decorated shower curtains, upholstery tacks, uh, wax flowers. Uh, and it was really got me away from painting. And it most of all, it got me away from the history of painting. I really felt the pressure of 3,000 years of painting sitting on my shoulders. And it really gave me a, a break at this point uh, to be doing something that was basically not painting or sculpture. By the way, this is a pretty small group, so if you have questions, please just holler them out. Uh, you won't be interrupting. And. Um, as a kind of a continuation of the constructions almost, like these drawings uh, are ink on paper, and they are uh, dealing with the idea of a frame within a frame and decorative elements like this sort of pinafore that the skeleton is wearing, uh, flowers. Um, I'm really, uh, and also domesticity in general. Uh, became my subject at this point. Um, also, I'm living in San Francisco and many of my friends are the underground comic people. S. Clay Wilson, Robert Crumb, Spain Rodriguez. Um, they really overlapped with the other art world in San Francisco a lot. And so I, um, I admired them, I uh, admired their discipline, I admired their draftsmanship, and I admired their, uh, their idea that they wanted to reach a really wide audience. Um, and of course, this is the, uh, the days of incredible political uh, upheaval and turmoil. Um, half, the, half of my school classes were canceled because of demonstrations and this and that. Uh, so it was really hard to avoid uh, politics and thinking about politics. And um, that idea that someone was dedicating their lives to something that would be other than a kind of isolated ivory tower kind of situation. Um, well, I, th I found that quite admirable. 
Uh, and these are drawings that I had in my first one-person show. And at the time, I was also had my first teaching job, which was at San Jose City College. And um, that was a, a wonderful experience. It really was. So that's why the title of the show uh, was called Love Letters from San Jose, uh, because I was basically living in San Jose and getting ready for this um, exhibition that I was going to have in San Francisco. And of course, gender issues were on my mind. Uh, I thought of these characters, very gender specific here. Um, whoops, and this is actually n not my drawing, but a drawing of me uh, by Robert Crumb. Uh, this is my own self-portrait as Van Gogh. There was a lot of discussion at the time uh, about what does a, uh, a crazy woman artist look like? Uh, and is a crazy woman scarier than a crazy man? Um, so th <laughs> this was the result of this um, thinking about that. And then the construction started getting a little more three-dimensional. Uh, this is on a stand that's higher than a regular table, maybe this high. And the stand <coughs> is upholstered with black velvet. There's a vitrine <coughs> with um, uh, wood putty uh, holding it together. And it's fluted like a pie crust, uh, like my grandmother taught me how to flute uh, pie, pie crust. And there, the figures are on a mound of hair, and the hairnet is uh, decorated with rhinestones. So you can see there's this idea about bad taste and, um, oh, the oh too beautiful, the, the appetite the sensual appetite for things that uh, have very specific kinds of textures and shine. Uh, this actually uh, is like uh, a utilitarian lamp. Uh, I wired the inside like a, a, a lamp and uh, you could leave it on in your house and it would be like a, a night lamp. Uh, I applique this doily that goes underneath this sculpture. Um, and I was very involved uh, for, mm, I would say, six or seven years making these uh, constructions, I would call them. And then at a certain point, I couldn't make it grow. It was so much about the subject matter and so little about the form that it didn't generate itself in any way. Um, and it just it went away. Uh, and then I'm sneaking into painting, um, going about it one brush stroke at a time. This is a self-portrait. Uh, and I took on this almost like building something, this kind of construction of feeling like you're putting the fur, the, ra the flowers, the ribbons on the paper. And um, this was you know, really about control issues. Um, this also, and at this point I, uh, have abandoned acrylic paint and I'm painting with gouache, which became a, a major medium for me. Um, I really like the physical uh, qualities of gouache and I still do a lot of work with gouache. So I'm kind of sneaking into painting here and all of these are mm, roughly 40 by 30 in size.
And then I'm combining the color with the line drawing. This is tools of the trade. This is a mother teaching her daughter about iconography of femininity. <laughs> and this is black gouache with a blue gouache line. I've always uh, admired Abraham Lincoln. That's uh, uh, this lady skeleton is painting a picture of Abraham Lincoln here. Uh, he said great things like everybody is responsible for their own, after the age of 40, everybody is responsible for their own face. I don't know what that means, but. <laughs> And right at this time, uh, I'm getting a little away from overt uh, political feminist statements. And I've discovered Carl Jung. Uh, uh, this is like 78 now. And uh, so I've, I'm reading a lot of Jung. Um, I'm actually going to a hypnotherapist in San Francisco that I went to for about five years, and it was an amazing experience, a life-changing experience, because it gave me such confidence in my intuition. I'd always had leanings that way, but this really uh, was uh, quite an immersion in uh, that kind of thought. And so I'm sticking my big toe into the water here and um, starting to attempt to paint these narrative scenes. And this is gouache and watercolor on paper. And this is a big mermaid. And, in her hand is a little sailor, and he's wagging his anchor at her. Think about, <laughs> think of that what you might. <laughs> uh, and this, I think, is a really pretty awful painting, but uh, I really um, take great uh, care to remember certain experiences throughout my life. Uh, these moments, uh, and I, I call them like moments of sudden knowledge, uh, sort of numinous m moments. And when I was a kid growing up in East LA and I was walking home from kindergarten, a monkey jumped out of the uh, fo foliage and I I don't think I'd been to the zoo or anything. I, I wasn't sure what it was, whether it was another child or what it was. <laughs> and it was this moment of connection uh, that was just remarkable. And um, I'm sort of careful to <laughs> remember that. And there's some kind of meaning in that that I'm still unraveling. And it, at this point in my life, I would go to the San Francisco Zoo and uh, draw the monkeys and uh, the, ma the mandrels and the, and the primates. Oops, this is not my painting. This is um, my heritage, really. This is David Park, and I'm really thrilled to see that there's uh, an exhibition at Yale right now of Diebenkorn and David Park and uh, Manuel Neri, who is the sculptor, and Elmer Bischoff. And um, so these were the paintings that I saw when I was a young artist and I came to uh, the San Francisco area from uh, the LA area. And they're all incredible colorists. And I really learned a lot from them. And 
there, I, I don't know where Richard Diebenkorn originated, but David Park was actually from Massachusetts, I think. There's this mythology that there's something about California sunshine that makes colorists out of everyone. But mm -hmm. I think the, the truth of the matter is that David Park was looking hard at Matisse. And um, there's this idea about color for its own sake. So the, the light in this painting is really coming from this body. And uh, that's very different than a, a, a painting that has a lot of value contrast. Uh, so I really absorbed that. Now this is a little later uh, where I'm really trying to get back to real painting. And this is a small gouache. Uh, in the late 70s, I uh, spent about four months in Mexico, which I, you know, California used to be part of Mexico, and uh, I quite love the Mexican culture. And uh, I had been really looking hard at Diego Rivera and uh, Jose Guadalupe Posada, and I decided to go see if maybe I would want to live in Mexico. And I spent four months there and worked on these small miniatures. And this was the first big painting that I'd made for uh, a long time. And this painting was in the Bad Painting Show uh, in New York. And when it was told to me I was going to be in a painting a show called Bad Painting. I was also told that meant bad, like wow, that's bad, like good. <laughs> uh, and then for several years after that, I would get reviews uh, on my work that would say things like, yeah, bad, you better believe it. The <laughs> So I think that there was always a, an incredible misunderstanding <laughs> around the title. But I had a real sense of what the show was about. And I knew Marsha Tucker very well. And I think part of her idea with the show was that she was trying to break down the New York uh, provincialism and uh, uh, kind of isolation. Uh, uh, the New York School and be more inclusive, make a more inclusive art world. And, peop, you know, it was happening. Minimalism had kind of run its course and there was more and more kind of imagery and uh, strange things showing up uh, in, in, the, uh, in galleries. This is a close-up. This was actually inspired by an experience I had in Mexico where I was out walking in the woods and surprised a wild turkey and he fanned his tail at me. This is another artist that was in the Bad Painting show. And um, lately I've been thinking about the artists that I really came of age with. And this artist is Jim Albertson. He lives in Sacramento. And we were all like bad painters together <laughs> for quite a number of years. And we would, you know, get together, talk about art. And uh, he, w he really tests the limit, this artist. This is Chaz Garabedian, who's also, um, I guess, been here to the Vermont Center a lot. I, I would always hear him talk about coming here. Uh, I love his work. I've known his work since the Bad Painting Show, really. I love this one. I love this surfer guy. <laughs> And this is Joan Brown, who was also in the Bad Painting Show. Mm -hmm. This is uh, a painting of her seen in the last couple of years in Canada Gallery. Mm -hmm. 
And this now brings uh, the material up to 1980. This was uh, the first painting I painted after moving from California to New York uh, in 1980. And ba basically, when I came for the Bad Painting Show, it looked like it would be safe for me to move to New York, that I would actually be able to maybe show my work in New York. Uh, previous to that, I thought I would not have a chance in hell of showing my work because of what I would see uh, in the magazines and so forth. That, um, the scene really wasn't open to any kind of uh, figuration. Uh, so this is a, I don't know how big this is, uh, not real big, not real little. Um, um, I had the, the experience with Jung and it kind of brought me into uh, thinking about mythology and also folk tales and fairy tales. And uh, I read a lot of uh, Claude Levi Strauss. And I, I, I guess I found literature generally uh, inspiring um, with my work. And there was this uh, South American folk tale that inspired me to paint this painting that was, the story goes that a woodpecker is a creature that can tell you where your husband is in the forest and it can tell you the sex of your unborn child and uh, all kinds of great uh, magical kinds of communications you can have with a woodpecker. This was right around the same time. And there's uh, things that are developing in my work that uh, are showing up at this point, like shifts in light within the same figure, uh, dividing the figure and making parts of it warm and parts of it cool uh, is an idea that I still work with. This is what New York City looked like in 1984. <laughs> this is Schnabel, uh, Lupertz, and Immendorf. <laughs> So now I'm venturing back and becoming a little more spontaneous. Uh, I think because I spent so much time, money, and effort making really bad paintings with oil paint um, by, oh, just diving in and, uh, uh, I just had had enough. And then at this point, I'm beginning to feel a little more confident again and beginning to feel as though I know a little bit more about what I'm doing and uh, I'm a little bit more in control of the space and thinking about the light. And um, then I can allow myself to um, be a little more gestural and uh, maybe even experimental with the paint. And uh, this painting's about mm, four and a half by six feet. And this is a gouache done around the same time. Uh, this is called Woman with Beautiful Hair. And this is a gouache about 50 by 40 inches. And um, this is also a large gouache. Uh, I'm kind of skirting around the edge of cuteness here. Uh, I gave a lot of thought about that cow's 
uh, eyelashes. Um, these are all big gouache paintings. Oops. Three girls named Mary with uh, Pokey there in the distance. And this, I was really confused about how far I wanted to go with Kitsch. And I couldn't decide whether it was poetic or if it looked like a Kleenex ad. And I guess they were, those two are not mutually exclusive necessarily. <laughs> but uh, it was a moment of pondering. Uh, and I, I thought to myself, did I really paint a pony with a white mane in the forest with a butterfly? <laughs> is, is that a good thing? Which reminds me, um, I mean, I feel like my unconscious was colonized really early by Disney. Um, who, and I, I, I really respect Disney is the long and the short of it. Um, I guess there was a lot of complaints at the time that um, he dropped, oh no, I know what the complaint was, that they were too scary. Uh, that was the uh, complaint. Um, and they were scary, um, but they were. Uh, this is 85. What was that? Yes, these are paintings on paper. This is gouache. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, there's been a, some conversation about people like Paul McCarthy uh, and the fact that he's from the L.A. culture, which is very permeated with the entertainment, and, and how Disney figures into, into his work. Um, this is, I, I rarely use themes for, that are actually known, but this is uh, the image of Psyche and Amor. And this is, is an image that has been painted by painters uh, in history. And I think because it is about light. And this is the point where Psyche is told that she can't see a moor in the light, but her sisters come around and say, what do you really know about this guy? And, uh, and she, the, her curiosity gets the better of her, and she sneaks up on him while he's sleeping and sees him in the light. And um, I love that story, and it lends itself to painting very well. Uh, this is around the same period, around uh, 1985. And what is the Did what? Um, this is uh, 25 by 35. Uh, gouache is really expensive, so by this time I have uh, gotten into making my own, which I still do. It's not that hard. It's sort of like cooking, really. And um, it's much less expensive. This is kind of how I work. And I do a lot of studies with gouache. And I really, it's really important to me to make everything up. Uh, I really don't use photographic sources. Um, and I do paint from life, but it never turns out to be art. Um, I enjoy the, the practice or experience of painting from life. 
So I make a lot of these really small gouaches. And when I say a lot, I have possibly thousands. And I kind of recycle them. And I pull a few out. And it's kind of like reading into tea leaves or something. And uh, the imagery uh, evolves out of this um, really uh, experience of, of working on paper. Uh, this is getting uh, along a little more. This is, uh, this painting's about five by six feet. It's called Pilgrim. And this is oil paint. I really, uh, hmm. I really believe in the process, and I really believe in one's connections to materials. And I've experimented a lot, and I'm always excited about trying out new materials. And at this point, I had just discovered black gesso, <laughs> and. Uh, I worked with that for a while. Uh, so the black that's there is actually uh, the gessoed ground. And this, uh, I have found that because I really uh, believe in being spontaneous, I, I, I have this uh, way of judging art and if the artist is really discovering something in the process the work seems to have a life beyond just looking at it uh, briefly um, but that process is a little unwieldy so what happens is you get pieces that are more self-conscious or less self-conscious. And with this painting, I was very happy with because it just kind of came out of nowhere. And it wasn't a struggle, and it had everything that I wanted. It had scale, which was something that I really learned about after moving to New York. Um, the I didn't see that much art in California, to tell you the truth. I mean, actually, the LA County Museum is really pretty good. Um, but I didn't see a lot of contemporary art. And there was something about coming and seeing real Pollocks and um, seeing a lot of large-scale contemporary art. I really kind of really learned the value of uh, having a, a scale and, and a dynamic scale be part of uh, one's vocabulary. So I was really happy that this giant kitten kind of showed up on this painting. And I was very happy that it was modeled in light and dark kind of effortlessly. It was almost like it was done in a trance, really. And um, you know, it just doesn't happen all that often. <laughs> but I'm constantly trying to figure out how to make it happen more often. Um, this is a more modest sized painting. Usually, I didn't, the paintings with figures are uh, life size. There's something about painting a figure actual size that works for me and painting it on canvas when it's smaller, doesn't work so well. Um, so this is, uh, I don't know how big this is, maybe three and a half by four feet, something along those d dimensions. And I don't know why, I haven't really thought about it, but the women in my paintings are usually have some kind of job and carrying buckets is, part is often the job. And I sort of think of this as Jill minus Jack 
um, hints the other bucket there. <laughs> uh, another gouache. And another treatment of Psyche and Amor. This is a, a very small gouache painting. The moment that Psyche sees Amor in the light. And as the story goes, he goes back to his mother. His mother is Venus. And, um, Psyche has to follow him through the underworld. to get him back. This is probably around three and a half by three and a half feet. So the ha hands are bigger than life. This is a big painting. And this reflects uh, an interest that I have in James Ensor. Uh, there's certain figures in art history that I've really tracked down and uh, I've, I've had books with the reproductions since I was a teenager. And uh, it so happened that the Getty in the 70s bought uh, James Ensor's giant painting, Christ's Entry into Brussels, but I'd always had in mind to paint a painting with a crowd scene um, previously, but I, I could never quite do it. Uh, it happened this time. Uh, um, These creatures show up. Um, this is a squirrel guarding her nuts. <laughs> Frog. This is a, a really large painting, a concert. And I paint flowers. Uh, I usually have a flower painting going at all times, and I work on multiple paintings at the same time. So it gives me a chance to not tell a story, basically. Um, and it, the process works well for me because what has happened, because I really don't like to use um, external sources uh, to draw from, I've kind of memorized the structure of all available flowers, uh, which isn't that difficult, but um, uh, I have flowers around and, and I, I find it inspiring to look at them, but because I kind of know and can work with and invent these uh, flowers as I go along, I, it allows me to be really spontaneous and and more formal uh, in the process. This uh, is oil paint. Yeah, this is oil. This is oil. Yeah. So all of these that I'm showing now are oil paint. And uh, because I work with gouache for a, a long time, and gouache is naturally really graphic, and when I would show them together, people would say, oh, I really like the gouache, and I, you know, go, <laughs> <laughs> and 
the wash did have a charge that the oil paintings didn't. And what I finally figured out was that I needed to use big, uh, like soft hair brushes, not bristle brushes. I needed to mix my paint in a container so that the brush would be really loaded so you would get like a clear line along the edge. Um, and then I finally figured it out. And also, I, I, I'm kind of deviating right now, but also I usually don't mix the color on the canvas. Um, I'm mixing it in the containers, which is kind of mimics the gouache process. So then the, the oil painting begins to look a lot more uh, graphic and more like uh, the gouache. And this is a pretty long, un unwieldy painting. I remember the, when I decided, no, I'm just going to go out and get some flowers, and I'm just going to paint flowers. And these ranunculus were part of that. And I went to the flower market, and I couldn't control myself. And I ended up buying $300 worth of flowers. <laughs> and of course, they were all dead in three days. <laughs> Okay, so this is uh, a life-size figure. This is about a, a six by five and a half or, uh, foot painting. And that's the, year for this? the what? Year for this? The year. Oh, the year. Um, let's see. Uh, er, er, er. I think uh, 2002, I think. The, the, the uh, uh, dipper. <laughs> also a large, large painting. Uh, around the, this, these two paintings were in the same show around the same time. And then this is a little later, where I'm getting a little more free uh, with the paint. This is oil, yeah. And this is, I don't know, six by five, or six and a half by five. Uh, I was very... Um, steeped in fairy tales for quite a long time. In fact, I was teaching a class at the School of Visual Arts on fairy tales. Um, and one of the things I like about fairy tales is they're like mythology, only the circumstances are usually really domestic. You know, the porridge is boiling over and so forth. And also a lot of it uh, involves these sort of packs or bargains made with animals and insects. Um, find that appealing. And I believe this is now 2008. And I usually like to title my shows. I've done that since the very beginning. Uh, and I titled this show that this painting is from uh, Sweet Talk. And it was actually part of a title of a fairy tale anthology. And this is a big, very big painting. It might be seven feet by five and a half. Oops. 
this is a large gouache. Uh, it's called Women Looking for Men. You're probably wondering how I'm sitting in my loft in <laughs> on Canal Street thinking, <laughs> thinking of this imagery, but um, uh, we have a, a, a funky farm in upstate New York that where we spend the summers, where I get my nature uh, injection. It's a very large oil. This is called Plenty. And this is called Blaze, but it's really inspired by Snow White, the story of Snow White. Uh, and I'm thinking about uh, how s the story of Snow White is really about sexual jealousy um, and Anne Sexton wrote an incredible book called Transitions that's the retelling of fairy tales and there's one really sexy uh, poem in there about Snow White This is a really big painting, uh, probably close to seven feet, six feet high. Somebody actually bought this and has it in their house, which pleases me no end. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> they have to talk about it. <laughs> So uh, I collect uh, little tchotchkes and plaster casts, actually, and sometimes I do paintings that are kind of based on, on them a little bit. Um, so just part of the mix. This painting is actually going to be in a show that opens next week. Uh, Oh, God, what's the name of the gallery? It's on Bleecker Street. I've got a mental block against the name of the gallery. Sorry. <laughs> but it's a show that uh, Peter Saul curated. Uh, he's a longtime friend from uh, California. This is a small gouache uh, called Protégé. Picnic. This is a gouache. And now these are getting uh, up to paintings that were in my last show. So um, this is a big oil painting and it's called Drink. or tigress. <laughs> Picnic. These are all very, very large uh, 
paintings. I can't remember what this is called. Cave. It's always an issue when I'm painting, uh, and it's the face is usually the last thing. And it's so hard uh, to have a painting with a face and not have the face take over the painting. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to be, as time goes by, like I want the painting to be more abstract and more realistic at the same time. Or not necessarily realistic, but uh, have a lot of information, like real illusion uh, information. oil painting, small oil painting. <laughs> This is bigger than life size, uh, meaning this is a dash hound, <laughs> and the painting is probably, mm, I, it's about 60 inches, I think. Gouache. women waiting for horsemen. <laughs> Deja vu. And these are very recent gouaches. will be in my next show. And that's the last slide. Okay.